Hello, gremlins and gold chasers. My name is TB Skyne, and this is a very silly video that I'm not really supposed to be making right now, but I'm doing it anyway because, I don't know, I guess I want to. <laughs> so patch 10.23 is out, which is the preseason patch for League of Legends, and it's one of the bigger ones in recent memory. So big, in fact, that my friend Dinka jokingly suggested that I should do an audiobook reading through all of it. And that's a very silly thing that's probably not going to be very useful to very many people, except perhaps to put them to sleep after a long day. And so I decided to do it anyway, even though it's absolutely not what I'm supposed to be spending my time on right now. So here is the patch 10.23 patch notes read to you in a calm voice by a relatively soft-spoken YouTuber. <clears throat> it's that time again. It's pre-season, baby. And this year, we're moving and shaking with huge item changes from the item shop you open up every game to updates to some, for some of your favorites to an all-new majestic tier of mythic items. As usual, we'll be closely monitoring all the balance metrics we've outlined earlier this year and see how these changes affect the overall meta for veterans. Additionally, a huge goal of ours with this item rework was to help the system feel a lot more intuitive for all players, both old and new. So, let us know your thoughts. Take this portal if you're looking for TFT's patch notes. For the moment, we are not. This is by Paul Riot Ether, Pershite, Trisha Momcat Tan, Hannah Shiushojo Wu. We'll skip the patch highlights because, well, there's not much to read on those. And start with the new item shop. The item shop refresh was designed with a few different goals. We wanted to create a streamlined, data-based recommended items experience, improve the usability of the all items view, maintain the ability to use and import item sets, and update the visual look and feel to match League's evolving aesthetic. As always, we'll be keeping our ears to the ground and we'll continue working with you all to make the best item shop we can, or make the item shop the best it can be, rather. The recommended items page displays relevant items for your champion based on where you currently are in your build, who you're up against, and how the game is progressing. It's meant to provide a quick way for you to understand what comes next on your journey to go plus ultra. Data-driven recommendations. The presented item up items update based on the most popular build for your champion. Item advice. Find out if an item will help you specifically stomp a pesky opponent or if it's a generally all-around good choice. Commonly built displays some of the most common item purchases for your champion. Which lets us move on to the All Items section. The All Items page is where you go if you want to see all the items. It contains everything you need to slice and dice the Armory of League down to reasonable chunks. You've got a class tab. Your champion's class tab will automatically be selected, which helps you avoid looking at tank items on Ari, unless that's your thing. A recommended tab. The recommended tab displays all the completed items your champion likes to build, as well as their components. Clicking on this will raise your MMR. I wonder if that qualifies as false advertising. Stat filters. Stat filters allow you to find that special ability power plus attack speed item you've been looking for this holiday season. Moving on to quick buy panels, you may have noticed some tabs hanging out on the left side of the shop. Introducing the quick buy panels. They make commonly purchased items like potions, elixirs, wards, and boots easy to access and quick to buy. The consumables tab contains all potions, elixirs, and that control ward you swore you would buy if you weren't saving up for a BF sword. The boots tab holds all manner of foot, foot coverings. The Inventory tab allows quick access to your inventory for selection, selling, and admiration. And now, let's talk about Mythic Items. Mythic Items are the new, highest item tier that will become the cornerstone of your build, with big effects that define your playstyle in each game. You can only own one at a time, so selecting a Mythic Item and the effects it grants depends on your opponents and the game state. Your Mythic also sets the tone for the rest of your build, both in terms of which other items you'll want to pick up, as well as a Mythic passive that adds extra stats to your other fully completed items, now known as Legendary Items. Mythic Items generally carry the most complex effects and strongly impact your game style. Even with the addition of a near new tier of item, 
Our goal isn't to inflate the power level of items overall. Mythics make your first choice more powerful than in the past, but we're borrowing that strength from the other item tiers to help keep build strength relatively similar on the whole. Like a four-leaf clover, mythic items are unique and you can only own one at a time. Mythic passive. Each mythic item has a passive that grants your legendary items bonus stats. Feels shiny and new. Mythic item icons are animated in the shop and HUD, or HUD. And the first mythic item we'll look at is the Gale Force for mobility. Gale Force gives marksman champions a way to dodge high impact skill shots or aggressively finish off low health targets. It's got base stats of 3400 gold cost, a build path out of the Noon Quiver Cloak of Agility pickaxe and 625 gold, 55 attack damage, 20% attack speed, and 20% critical strike chance. For the effects, it has an active called Cloud Burst, dash in a target direction, firing three missiles at the lowest health enemy near your destination, prioritizing champions. It deals a total of 180 to 315 based on your level and bonus AD, magic damage increased against low health targets by up to 50% on a 90 second cooldown. It also grants all other legendary items 3% movement speed. Then we have the Kraken Slayer, which is an anti-tank item. The Kraken Slayer allows a free-firing marksman to cut even the beefiest enemies down to size. Its base stats are 3400 gold cost. It uses the Noon Quiver, Cloak of Agility and a Pickaxe plus 625 gold to build. 60 attack damage, 25% attack speed, and a 20% critical chance. For the effects, it's got Bring It Down, which means that every third basic attack deals an additionally 60 plus percent AD true damage. It grants all other legendary items 10% attack speed. Then there's the Immortal Shield Bow, which allows you to survive burst. Immortal Shield Bow helps marksman champions survive burst damage and fight their way back from the brink. For its base stats, it costs 3400 gold, it uses the Noon Quiver, Cloak of Agility, Vampiric Scepter, and 600 golds to build. It has 50 attack damage, 15% attack speed, a 20% critical strike chance, and 12% lifesteal. As for its effects, it has Lifeline. When taking damage that will reduce you below 30% health, gain a 250 to 700 health shield, depending on your level, for 3 seconds. Additionally, you will gain 15% lifesteal for 8 seconds on a 90 second cooldown. It will grant all other legendary items 5 attack damage and 50 bonus health. Sunfire Aegis gives you ramping damage. It turns tanks into dangerous threats for enemies who take extended fights. On his base stats, it costs 3200 gold. It uses the Bami Cinder, Aegis of the Legion, and 700 gold to build. It has 450 health, 30 armor, 30 magic resist, and 15 ability haste. As for its effects, it has Immolate, and it deals 20 to 40 based on your level and your bonus health, magic damage per second to nearby enemies, increased by 50% against minions and 200% against monsters. Damaging champions or epic monsters with this effect adds a stack, increasing subsequent immolation damage by 12% for 5 seconds, up to a maximum of 6 sta stacks. At maximum immolate stacks, your basic attacks burn nearby enemies for your immolate damage per second for 3 seconds. As a mythic, it grants all other legendary items 5 ability haste. Moving on to the Frostfire Gauntlet, which slows enemies. It says that it can turn any tank into an inescapable behemoth. It costs 3200 gold. It uses the Bami Cinder Null Magic Mantle Chain Vest and 950 gold to build. It has 350 health, 50 armor, 25 magic resist, and 15 ability haste. It shares the same immolate effect with the previous item, but it also has Snowbind, which creates a slow zone for 1.5 seconds on a 4 second cooldown. Enemies that move across that zone are slowed by 30% plus a percentage based on your max health. It will grant all other legendary items 100 health and increases your champion's model size by 7.5%. That's going to be fun to build in a Cho'Gath. Then we have Turbo Chem Tank, which is an initiation item. For the tanks who love starting fights, Turbo Chem Tank allows them to lead the charge into battle. It costs 3200 gold, it builds out of the Bami Center, Cloth Armor, Negatron Cloak, and 1000 gold. It has 350 health, 
25 armor, 50 magic resist, and 15 ability haste. It shares the immolate effect with the previous items, but it also has supercharged, which grants 75% move speed towards enemy champions or turrets for 4 seconds. Once near an enemy, or after 4 seconds, a shockwave is emitted that slows nearby champions by 40% for 2 seconds on a 90 second cooldown. It will grant all other legendary items plus 5% tenacity and slow resistance. Then we have the Duskblade of Drakthar, which is a multi-kill item. With the Duskblade, assassins can keep their enemies guessing while wrecking invisible havoc in teamfights. I think that's supposed to be reeking rather than wrecking, but that may just be me. It costs 3200 gold. It uses the Serrated Dirk, Caulfield's Warhammer, and 1000 gold to build. It has 55 attack damage, 18 lethality, and 20 ability haste. For effects, it has the unique Night Stalker, which uh, says that attacking a champion deals an additional 100 plus a percentage of your bonus AD, physical damage, and slows them by 99% for a quarter of a second on a 15 second cooldown. When a champion that you have damaged within the last 3 seconds dies, this cooldown is refreshed and you become invisible for 1.5 seconds. It will grant all other legendary items 5 ability haste. Then there's the Eclipse. It helps assassins weave in and out of fights and take down tankier opponents in drawn-out encounters. It costs 3200 gold, uses the Serrated Dirk Vampiric Scepter Longsword and 850 gold to build. It has 55 attack damage, 18 lethality, and 10% Omnivamp. Its effects include the Ever-Rising Moon, which says that hitting a champion with two separate basic attacks or abilities within 1.5 seconds deals an additional 8% max health physical damage, grants you 30% movement speed, and a 150 plus some percentage of your bonus AD um, damage for melee champions, or 100 plus a percentage of your bonus AD for range champions shield for 2 seconds. 6 second cooldown for melee champions, 12 second cooldown for ranged champions, and it'll grant all of the legendary items 4% armor penetration. The Prowler's Claw is an assassination item, and it lets assassins get up close and personal with their prey, amplifying their damage for one fatal combo. It's the Rengar item, in other words. At 3200 gold, it needs a Serrated Dirk, Coalfield's Warhammer, and 1000 gold to build. It has 55 attack damage, 21 lethality, and 10 ability haste. Its effects include an active called Sand Swipe, which allows you to dash through a target enemy, dealing 100 plus 30% bonus AD physical damage for the next 3 seconds. You will deal 15% increased damage to the target on a 60 second cooldown. It'll grant all of the legendary items plus 5 lethality. Moving on to Leandri's Anguish, which is an anti-tank item. Leandri's Anguish allow mages to burn through the health and resistances and excel in longer fights. It costs 3400 gold, uses a lost chapter in a fiendish codex and 1200 gold to build. It has 80 ability power, gives you 600 mana and 20 ability haste. Dealing damage with abilities, this is the torment effect, causes enemies to burn for 15 plus 2.5% AP plus 1% max health magic damage per second for 4 seconds you gain 5% magic penetration per second against any target that's burning up to 25%. That's 5 stacks. It grants all other legendary items 5% ability haste. Luden's Tempest is a burst damage item. It offers mages upfront burst power and the speed to reposition for another round. It costs 3400 gold. It uses a lost chapter and a blasting wand and 1250 gold to build. It has 80 ability power, 10 magic penetration, 600 mana, and 10 ability haste. As for its effects, it has Echo, which means that damaging abilities will deal an additional 100 plus a percentage of your um, uh, AP magic damage to the target and 3 nearby enemies and grant you 30% movement speed for 2 seconds on a 10 second cooldown. It'll grant all other legendary items 5 magic penetration. The Everfrost is an item that helps you slow enemies. With Everfrost, mages can control the battlefield and lock down their opponents in ice. This is especially useful for disengaging. It costs 3400 gold. It is built from a lost chapter and a blasting wand and 1250 gold. It has 80 ability power, 200 health, 600 mana, and 10 ability haste. 
As for its effects, it has an active called Glaciate, which deals 100 plus a percentage of your AP, magic damage in a cone, slowing enemies by 65% for 1.5 seconds. Enemies at the center of the cone are rooted instead, and it's on a 20 second cooldown. It will grant all legendary items 15 ability power. The Hextech Rocket Belt is a mobility item. It gives shorter range mages a way to blast onto the scene to get in range to destroy enemy champions. It costs 3200 gold. It uses a Hextech Alternator, a Ruby Crystal, a Blasting Wand, and 900 gold to build. It has 80 ability power, 250 health, and gives you 15 ability haste. As for its effects, it has an active called Supersonic. Dash in a target direction, unleashing an arc of magic missiles rather, that deal 200 to 300 damage, based on your level and your AP, in magic damage. Then gain 75% movement speed towards enemy champions for 2 seconds on a 40 second cooldown. It will grant all legendary items 5 magic penetration. Now we have the Rift Maker, which has a very ominous, void looking eye in its icon. It is an Omni Vamp item. Mages and tankier magic damage dealers can dominate fights that go long with ramping damage and healing. It costs 3200 gold. It uses the Leeching Leer, the Blasting Wand, and 10, uh, 1050 gold to build. It has 80 ability power, 150 health, 15 ability haste, and 15% Omni Vamp. As for its effects, it has one called Void Corruption. For each second in champion combat, you will deal 3% bonus damage, maximum 15%. At maximum strength, the bonus damage is dealt as true damage instead. It will grant all legendary items, plus 5% magic penetrations. Then we have the Night Harvester, which is another multi-kill item. It's a great tool for magic damage dealing assassins and bruisers who want to work their way through the entire enemy team rather than taking out one target and then bouncing out of the fight. It costs 3200 gold, it uses the Hextech Alternator Ruby Crystal Blasting Wand and 900 gold to build. It has 80 ability power, 250 health, and 15 ability haste. As for effects, it says that damaging a champion deals an additional 175 to 250 based on your level and your, mag uh, and your AP, magic damage, and grants you 25% movement speed for 1.5 seconds on a 60 second cooldown per enemy. It grants all legendary items ability haste. Then there's an old friend, the Trinity Force, a dueling item. It allows fighters to take over long fights with ramping attack damage and repeated bursts of Spellblade procs. It costs 3,333 gold to build in total, and it uses the Sheen, Hearthbound Axe, Kindle Gem, and 733 gold to build. It has 200 health, 35 attack damage, 35% attack speed, and 10 ability haste. Now, as for effects, it has a few. Threefold Strike means that basic attacks will grant you 25 movement speed for up to 3 seconds. If the target is a champion, increase your base attack damage by 6%, stacking up to 5 times, which means a maximum of 30% extra base attack damage. It also has Spellblade, which means that after using an ability, your next basic attack is enhanced with an additional 200% basic attack damage on a 1.5 second cooldown. It will grant all legendary items 10% extra attack speed. Moving on to the Gore Drinker, which is an item that allows you to survive burst. Fighters can come back from the brink of death with a well-timed thirsting slash heal and an increased attack damage while injured. It costs 3300 gold, it uses the Iron Spike Whip, the Phage, the Kindle Gem, and 200 gold to build. It has 400 health, 45 attack damage, 150% health regeneration, and 20 ability haste. Its active is the Thirsting Slash, which deals 110% of your attack damage to nearby enemies. You will restore health equal to 20% of your attack damage plus 12% of your missing health for each champion hit on a 15 second cooldown affected by ability haste. It also has Aggression, which lets you gain 1% attack damage for each 5% of your missing health up to a plus 15% of your maximum AD. It will grant all legendary items 5 ability haste. Then we have the Stride Breaker, which allows you to engage enemies. There is no escaping a fighter wielding Stride Breaker. It costs 3300 gold, 
It uses the Iron Spike Whip Hearthbound, Hearthbound Axe, rather, a Kindle Gem, and 200 gold to build. 300 health, 50 attack damage, 20 attack speed, and 10 ability haste are its stats. It has an effect, an active, called Halting Slash, which allows you to lunge a short distance and deal 110% of your attack damage to nearby enemies, slowing them down by 60%, decaying over 2 seconds. This is on a 20 second cooldown, affected by ability haste. It also has an effect called Heroic Gate, that means that dealing physical damage will grant you 30% more, rather 30 movement speed, not 30%, for 2 seconds. As a mythic, it will grant all legendary items 3% movement speed. Then we have the Divine Sunderer, which is an anti-tank item. Your health? Huh, <laughs> my health. This item allows fighters to steal chunks of their opponent's health with Spellblade and chew through tankier targets. Its base stats include uh, 3,300 uh, 3, as total cost. It is a build path of Phage, Sheen, Kindle Gem, and 700 gold. It, use, it gives you 400 health, 40 attack damage, and 20 ability haste. Now, it also has Spellblade, which we remember from the Trinity Force, which means every time you use a spell, you will deal extra damage to an enemy. Mythic will allow it to grant all legendary items 5% armor penetration and 5% magic penetration. Moving on to Shirelia's Battle Song, which is a team mobility item. And Shirelia's lets support players orchestrate flawless quintets by boosting allies' movement and damage at the start of fights. It costs 2700 gold, thank you very much for making it cheaper for the supports. Kindle Gem, Fairy Charm, Winged Moon Plate and 850 gold are the prerequisites for building it. It gives you 350 health, 20 ability haste, 5% movement speed, and 50% mana regeneration. As for its effects, it has an active called Inspire, which grants you and nearby allies 40% decaying movement speed for 4 seconds, and an additional 40 to 60 depending on your level, magic damage on the next 3 basic attacks or ability hits against champions on a 90 second cooldown. As a mythic, it will grant all other legendary items 2.5% movement speed. Then we have the Locket of the Iron Solari, which allows you to survive Burst. Help your team withstand the enemy offensive with team-wide protection. It costs 2700 gold, it uses a Kindle Gem, Aegis of the Legion, and 400 gold to build. It gives you 200 health, 20 ability haste, 30 armor, and 30 magic resistance. It has an active called Devotion, which grants nearby allies a 250 to 420 nice uh, shield based on level, decaying over 2.5 seconds on a 90 second cooldown. It will also grant nearby allied champions 5 armor and magic resist, and it will grant all legendary items a 2 armor and magic resist increase to Consecrate, which is its aura effect. Then we have the Moonstone Renewer, which deals healing over time. Dish out constant healing that ramps up over the fight, it says. Its base stats include a 2700 gold cost, it, co it uses a Kindle Gem, Bandle Glass Mirror, and 850 gold to build. It has 40 ability power, 200 health, 20 ability haste, and 100% 100 mana, 100 mana regeneration. And it says that it has an effect called Starlight, Starlit Grace, rather. When affecting champions with basic attacks or abilities in combat, restore 30 to 60 based on level health to the most wounded nearby ally on a 2 second cooldown. Each second spent in combat with champions increases this healing effect by 37.5% up to 150. It will grant all legendary items 5 ability haste. Moving on to the Imperial Mandate, which is an ally burst item. Use your CC to call the shots as you mark, as you mark enemies to be cut down by your team. It costs 2700 gold, it uses a Kindle Gem, Bandle Glass Mirror, and 850 gold to build. It gives you 40 ability power, 200 health, 20 ability haste, and 100% mana regen. As for its effects, it has the Mark of Enmity. Abilities that slow or immobilize a champion deal 60 to 100 bonus magic damage at levels 1 to 18, and marks them for 4 seconds. Allied de champion damage detonates this mark, dealing an additional 60 to 100 based on level, magic damage, and granting you both 20% movement speed for 2 seconds on a 6 second cooldown per enemy, so you'll want to spread this around a little bit. 
As a mythic, it will grant all other legendary items 15 ability power. And that does it for the mythic items. Now, if you're still with me, then either congratulations on your ability to stay focused through a lot of boring numbers, or else my condolences on how hard it must be for you to fall asleep tonight. Rest assured, though, I'm not going anywhere. There is quite a lot of patch notes still left to go, and we're going to get through all of it together. I've got myself a cup of tea now, which I will need, because maintaining this sort of pleasant speaking voice for an extended period of time is actually a little harder than it might seem. So, let's move on to the stat updates, and we'll start with Ability Haste. And it says, why did the Mythic section above talk about Ability Haste rather than cooldown reduction, and why didn't we explain Ability Haste first? Well, because Mythics are cooler, so we put them first for people with short attention spans. That's a little rude. Cooldown reduction was more valuable the more of it you got. Every percent reduced your cooldown by the same amount, say, one second off a hundred second cooldown. That one second didn't change, even as the cooldown shrank. For that same one hundred second cooldown, your thirty-first per point of CDR took one second off the remaining seventy second cooldown, which is more than one percent. As such, CDR had to be capped at 40% to avoid going out of control, locking you out of a lot of items once you reached that cap. Every point of ability haste lets you cast 1% faster. On paper, that makes it look like it gets less valuable the more you have because your cooldown shrinks by less and less each time. It's actually the same amount of power. 50 Ability Haste lets you cast an extra half a spell during the original cooldown. The next 50 get you to a full extra cast that is 100% faster. If you get another 100 Ability Haste, you get a whole other cast 200% faster. This linear scaling allows us to remove the cap so we can buy as much as you want. That sounds like it will lead to some amusing meme builds. Moving on to Vamp Effects. The big change here is that lifesteal now counts physical damage dealt by on-hit effects, since the idea is, heal from your attacks, it's more understandable if we include the whole attack. The other note is the addition of physical vamp, which currently exists just on the Sanguine Blade, so its sustain can apply to assassins. Oh, to assassins' abilities, rather, too. If you're curious about whether that means we'll eventually bring back spell vamp, the answer is... maybe. So, this includes Lifesteal, which lets you heal from physical damage dealt by basic attacks. It now includes on-hit effects. It's Physical Vamp, which means healing from physical damage dealt by basic attacks and abilities, which is 33% as effective for AoE and pet damage. Then there's Omnivamp, which allows you to heal from all sources and types of damage, still at a third of the effectiveness for AoE and pet damage. Moving on to Critical Strike. Reducing the value of each point of Critical Strike chance and offering less of it per item allows us to smooth out Marksman's build scaling and put more interesting and powerful unique effects on their items. They'll be stronger early and mid-game, and their late-game damage will be less unilaterally based on constant crits, since the other parts of their items will be more influential. Also, by spreading crit across five items, read every non-boots slot in Marksman builds, we can put crit chance on more items because Marksmen no longer run the risk of over-capping and losing access to items they otherwise would have wanted. So, critical chance on legendary and mythic items have gone down to 20%, meaning five items are needed to max out your critical strike dam uh, chance. And your base critical strike damage goes down from 200% to 175 percent. A little bit of a nerf there. Then we can move on to the new legendary items. Legendary is the category of item that used to be the most powerful tier. They are your completed non-boots items that don't build into anything else. We assessed different item classes to see which niches were most, most, most <laughs> needed to create more meaningful choices. We also ensured that tools were taken out of the item pool. Uh, tools that were taken out of the item pool had good replacements when it made sense. Since Leandris is now mythic, for instance, Demonic Embrace fills the niche for tankier item champs who can't pick Leandris every game but still need a burn effect to deal relevant damage in fights. 
Because Mercurial Scimitar is now geared more towards marksman champions, we created a new version for fighters and assassins. Grievous Wounds warrants a special callout. We want to give more people access to it in ways that feel appropriate for their playstyles. And the first new legendary item is the Collector. The Collector offers marksman champions a more aggressive option for when they find themselves facing squishy foes. It costs 3,000 gold to build. It uses a serrated dirk, a pickaxe, a cloak of agility, and 425 gold to build. It has 50 attack damage, 20% critical strike chance, and 12 lethality. As an effect, it has one called Death and Taxes. Dealing damage that would leave an enemy below 5% health executes them, and champion kills will grant an additional 25 gold. That would be the taxes part of the equation, I suppose. Then we have the Navori Quickblades, which is an Ionian-based item, just based on the name. Reduces cooldowns, it says. Navori Click Quickblades allow crit heavy builds to scale their ability casting as well. It costs 3400 gold, it uses a Caulfield's Warhammer, a pickaxe, a cloak of agility, and 825 gold to build. It has 60 attack damage, 20% critical strike chance, and ability haste at 30. It has an effect called Deft Strikes, which means that your critical strikes with basic attacks reduce your non-ultimate ability cooldowns by 20% of their remaining cooldown. So that will be quite useful, like when you've just cast an expensive ability and you want to get it back as fast as possible, I suppose. Then there's the Force of Nature, which these days I mostly know from TFT, which gives you ramping magic resistance. Force of Nature helps turn tanks into swift behemoths in the face of ability cast heavy enemy teams. It costs 2900 gold to build. It uses a Negatron Cloak, a Winged Moon Plate, a Ruby Crystal, and 800 gold to build. It uh, gives you 350 health, 60 magic resistance, and 5% movement speed. It has an effect called Absorb, which says that taking damage from abilities grants you 6 movement speed and 4 magic resistance for 5 seconds, stacking up to 5 times, and each unique ability instance will give you 1 stack, so getting hit 12 times by the same ability isn't going to do you much good. Now then, let's talk about the Serpent's Fang, which is an anti-shielding item. It helps assassins strike back against shield-heavy compositions that formerly rendered them weak. It costs 2800 gold, it uses a serrated dirk, a pickaxe, and 825 gold to build. It has 60 attack damage and 18 lethality, lethality rather, and has an effect called Shield Reaver, which means that basic attacks and abilities will deal 50 plus a percentage of your AD, addi additional physical damage to shielded targets. Then there's the Horizon Focus, which is a damage amplification item. It will give long-range artillery and control mages another damage alternative that loops into their playstyle. It costs 3,000 gold. It uses a needlessly large rod, a Hextech alternator, and 700 gold to build, and gives you 100 ability power. It has an effect called Hypershot, which says that damaging a champion with a non-targeted ability at over 750 range, or mobilizing them, reveals them and increases their damage taken from you by 10% for 6 seconds. That is going to be tremendously frustrating to deal with against certain champions, I'm sure. Then there's the Cosmic Drive, which is an ability haste item. If you want to deal death by a thousand spells instead of one needlessly large burst and move fast while doing it, this is for you. It costs 3000 gold, it uses a fiendish codex, a kindle gem, an amplifying tome, and 865 gold to build. It has 70 ability power, 200 health, and 30 ability haste. It has an effect called Spell Dance, which says that dealing damage with abilities will grant you 10 plus 20% ability haste movement speed for 4 seconds. Moving on to the Demonic Embrace, a helmet with a mask underneath it that looks suspiciously, li suspiciously like Jin's face, actually. It deals sustained damage, apparently. This is a new helmet for those bruisers and battle mages that want to get into the thick of things, bulk up, and deal excellent damage over time. You can just right rise, you know. 
Base stats, 3,000 gold. It uses a blasting wand, giant's belt, amplifying tome, and 815 gold to build. It gives you uh, 70 ability power and 350 health. It has an effect called Azakana Gaze, which very much confirms that it's meant to be an Ionian item, as it were. Dealing ability damage burns enemies for 1.5% max health magic damage every second for 4 seconds. You will gain 10 armor and magic resistance while a champion is affected, plus 2.5 armor and magic resist for each additional champion affected. So with 5 champions on the enemy team, that would be something like 30 armor and magic resistance, wouldn't it? No, I'm bad at math, doesn't matter. <laughs> no, 20. 20 rather. Then we have Cyrilda's Grudge. Now, Cyrilda is one of the three sisters of uh, Freljordian fame, which is interesting. Cyrilda's Grudge caps up off assassin builds, slowing enemies into their graves. With the rest of their items providing lethality to deal with carries early and mid-game, Grudge's Penetration gives its users the means to threaten tanks in the late game as well. It costs 3,400 gold. It uses the Callfield's Warhammer, the Last Whisper, and 850 gold to build. It has 45 attack damage, 30% armor penetration, and 20 ability haste. As for its effects, it has one called Betrayal, which means that damaging abilities slow enemies by 30% for one second. Silvermere Dawn removes crowd control. The CC cleansing option for fighters, as an alternative for Mercurial, which caters to crit users. It costs 3000 gold, predictably it uses the Quicksilver Sash, Pickaxe, and Ruby Crystal to build. It has 35 attack damage, 200 health, and 35 magic resistance. And as an active, it has of course the Quicksilver, which removes all disables except Airborne, and you gain 40% tenacity and slow resistance for 3 seconds. It cannot be used while affected by Airborne effects. Then there is the Kempunk Chainsword, which is just pure Warhammer 40k, which is an anti-healing item. Grievous Wounds option for fighters and assassins that will help you finish off pesky healer compositions when they are at low health. I'm going to take myself a sip of tea here. <sighs> nice and warm. It costs 2,700 gold. It uses the Executioner's Calling, Callfield's Warhammer, a Ruby Crystal, and 400 gold to build. It has 45 attack damage, 200 health, and ability haste at 15. As for its effects, it has one called Hackshorn. Dealing physical damage applies 40% Grievous Wounds to enemy champions for 2 seconds, and if the target is below 50% health, this effect is increased to 60% Grievous Wounds. Another chem weapon here, we have the Chemtech Putrefier, which is an anti-healing item as well. This is a Grievous Wounds option for support champions, which is amplified by immobilizing enemy champions. It costs 2300 gold. It uses the Oblivion Orb and the Bandle Glass Mirror and 450 gold to build. It has 50 ability power, 15 ability haste, 100% base mana regen, and its effects include Puff Cap Toxin, Puff Caps being the mushrooms that Teemo uses, which says that dealing magic damage applies 40% Grievous Wounds to champions for 2 seconds, immobilizing champions applies 60% Grievous Wounds instead. Soraka means must be crying. <laughs> then we have the Staff of Flowing Water, which allows you to buff spellcasters. This is a new item for enchanters that lets you support mage carries and zoom around alongside them. Its base stats include 2300 gold for the cost, a build path of the Forbidden Idol, Blasting Wand, and 650 gold. It has 60 ability power, 10% heal and shield power, and 100% ma base mana regen. As for its effects, healing or shielding an ally will grant you both 15% movement speed and 20 to 40 depending on level ability power for 3 seconds. Then we have the Stirring Ward Stone, and ah, my memories of supporting back in Season 3 come swirling back to me. <laughs> Ever needed one more pocket? We're taking a swing at solving the age-old inventory crunch for support players by giving them access to a growing item that can hold control wards. It costs 1100 gold, but you must be level 13 in order to purchase it. As for effects, it says that this item can store up to three purchased control wards. 
And it has another effect called Blooming Empire, which says that this item will transform into Watchful Ward Stone once you have placed 20 Stealth Wards. That leads us to the Watchful Ward Stone, which says keep your final slot for some combat power while establishing your dominance as the Vision Controller. It upgrades from the Stirring Ward Stone and gives you 25 Ability Haste. This item, it says, can store up to three purchased control wards, much like its previous version, but it also has an effect called Visions of Ishtal, which increase your stealth ward and control ward placement caps by one. Then we have the Vigilant Ward Stone, which also holds control wards, and this one says that you can scale into the game by turning your ward slot into a power slot. The six item fantasy is now a reality for supports. Well, <laughs> I somewhat doubt that, but it's nice that they're trying. It costs 2300 gold. It ha uses a watchful ward stone and 1200 gold to build. It has 40 ability haste and 10% move speed. It shares the abilities with the previous ward stone item, but it uh, is required to be uh, upgraded from the Watchful Ward Stone in order to purchase. It's just a little bit of extra stats on your control wards, basically. Then we have updated legendary items, which are old legendary items with a new coat of paint. Just like with, uh, with two our golds for new legendaries, I think there's a little bit of a typo there, we wanted to ensure existing options all offer a clear, unique reason to buy them and that the item shop, as a whole, gives champions the tools they need to bring their innate strengths to bear, play into their allies, and react to enemy threats. One trend, you'll notice, is that many active effects have been removed or changed into passives. We want mythics to house the most exciting and complex item effects, which mean meant simplifying legendaries to ensure builds overall weren't becoming more complicated. I appreciate that, even though I don't play the game much, much anymore. As a note, for each item below that has its own section, functionality has changed enough that the usual before to after treatment felt like the wrong approach. We want to equip you with the ability to evaluate when do I want to buy this item now and provide a clean, comprehensive rundown of what each item offers. Does that... Of what each item offers does that better. And that seems to be another little bit of a typo, or maybe I'm just reading the sentence wrong. There's a bucket at the bottom for items that are only getting small tuning adjustments. Those will have the before-after lists, since they work the same. So, the Mortal Reminder, with its fancy new icon, no longer grants armor penetration. It now builds from seal and offers improved Grievous Wounds. Previously, Mortal Reminder's percent penetration usually meant that completing it early was worse than building more damage, since enemies needed to stack armor before the penetration penetration really mattered. Now, Mortal Reminder's more favorable build path and upgraded Grievous Wounds on completion offer additional incentive to complete it at all stages of the game. It costs 2700 gold, it uses the Executioner's Calling and Seal for 700 gold to build, and 20, it gives you 20 attack damage, 25% attack speed, 20 critical chance, and move speed of 7% on top of it all. As for effects, it has sepsis, which is, uh, I believe, poisoning. Of uh, infect, is, uh, Isn't that uh, blood poisoning from infection? Something like that. Dealing physical damage applies 40% grievous wounds to enemy champions for two seconds. Dealing three consecutive basic attacks to an enemy champion enhances this to 60% grievous wounds against them until the effect is allowed to elapse. Then we have Ginsu's Rage Blade now grants on-hit damage based on critical strike chance, but you cannot crit. No longer grants stacking attack speed, no longer grants attack damage, ability power, or penetration. On-hit builds don't have many build options, since so much of the attack-focused portion of the shop is focused on the crit system. Rather than continue to have on-hit and crit continue fighting for item niches, Ginsu's Rageblade now acts as a bridge between the crit and on-hit ecosystems, allowing Kog'Maws to access effects like Phantom Dancer or Runan's Hurricane without wasting stats. It costs 2600 gold. It uses the Rage Knife, Cloak of Agility, Dagger, and 900 gold to build. It has 40% attack speed and 20% critical strike chance. As for its effects, it says that Wrath... Uh, means that basic attacks apply 45 physical damage on hit per 20% critical strike chance, but you can no longer critical strike. So that means you get at least five stacks of that, which is like a, ooh, that's like a hundred and 
That's a lot. That's many. That's many damage. Let's not do math while we're doing this. <laughs> Every third basic attack will apply your on hit effects twice. By the way, that's the seething strike effect. The Phantom Dancer no longer has lifeline. It grants ghosting, movement speed, and bonus attack speed after consecutive attacks. Phantom Dancer's defensive niche has been claimed by Immortal Shield Bow, so we're returning Phantom Dancer to its previous purpose as the highest attack and movement speed of the seal items. Its new passive emphasizes that Phantom Dancer is a top-tier choice when you can stand and fire in extended fights. It costs 2,900 gold. It uses the dagger seal and another dagger to build, plus 1,100 gold. It has 40% attack speed, 20% critical chance, and 7% move speed. It also grants you Spectral Waltz, which means that basic attack will give you ghosting and 7% move speed for 2 seconds. In addition, attacking 5 times causes Spectral Waltz to also grant 40% attack speed for the same duration. Then we have Lord Dominic's Regards. It now has critical strike chance. It deals additional damage against high health targets. Lord Dominic's Regards and OG Last Whisper from a few years ago has always occupied an anti-tank niche, but has also flip-flopped between marksmen and assassins, always stronger for one class than the other. Situational items like this should feel rewarding to purchase when the occupation arises, or occasion arises rather, meaning their stats need to be appropriately powerful for the class they are meant for. So, Lord Dominic's regards has acquired some crit and is balanced for marksmen alone, while assassins have the new Cyrilda's Grudge item above. Its base stats include 2,900 co uh, total cost. It uses a Last Whisper, a Cloak of Agility, and 850 gold to build. It has 30 attack damage, 20% critical strike chance, and 25% armor penetration. As for effects, it has Giant Slayer, which will deal up to 15% bonus physical damage against champions with greater max health than you. So it's good against tanks is basically what that stat line is saying. I need some tea, I think. The Essence Reaver now builds out of Sheen and has a Spellblade passive. The ability weaving pattern of Sheen has always been fun and popular on some Marksman champions, but Trinity Force frequently fell below the viability bar for those champions since it was balanced for fighters. Enter Essence Reaver, which has been revamped to double down on the fantasy of a spell-slinging basic attacker. It costs 2,900 gold. It uses the Caulfield's Warhammer, the Sheen, the Cloak of Agility, and 500 gold to build. It has 40 attack damage, 20% critical strike chance, and 20 ability haste, as well as the Spellblade effect, which we have discussed previously. So, the Infinity Edge, then. Increased critical strike damage now scales with critical strike chance. Infinity's Edge, Infinity Edge is an iconic and valuable part of the Marksman ecosystem, but buying it first most every game left little room for anything else to compete. We've re-envisioned Infinity Edge in a Death Cap-esque form that increases in value as a crit build progresses, allowing it to remain a staple power spike in crit builds without defining the Marksman early game with its awkward build path and lack of utility. It costs 3,400 gold. It uses a BF Sword Pickaxe and Cloak of Agility plus 625 gold to build. It has 70 attack damage, 20% critical strike chance, and as for effects, it has one called Perfection, which allows you to gain an additional 8% critical strike, uh, uh, strike damage per 20% critical strike chance, which gives you a maximum of plus 40% critical strike damage. Then there's the Mana Mune. It now provides Ability Haste. Spending mana without hitting a target no longer grants stacks. Mana per stack and transform threshold has been reduced. Mana Mune should be a valuable purchase to AD spellcasters who enjoy mana as well as AD. Ability Haste, in addition to the Muramana changes, should broaden the list of champions who can use this item. It costs 2,600 gold. It uses a Tear of the Goddess, Coalfield's Warhammer, a Sapphire Crystal, and 750 gold to build. It has 35 attack damage, 400 mana, and 15 ability haste. Among its effects are Awe, which lets you gain bonus AD equal to 2% of your maximum mana. It also has Mana Charge, which says that striking a target with an attack or ability to consume a charge and 
strike a target rather with an attack or ability to consume a charge and gain three bonus mana. Bonus mana is doubled if the target is a champion. This item transforms into Muramana once 450 bonus mana has been granted. Gain a new mana charge every 8 seconds, which allows us to move on to the Muramana, which is very much the same as the Manamune, but substantially more powerful. Following the Manamune changes, allowing Muramana to proc on abilities further encourages AD casters to consider a new addition to their item builds. Removing the mana consumption increases clarity and lets users focus more on letting their spells fly. It has 35 attack damage, 850 mana, and 15 ability haste. It has the awe effect that the Mana Mune has, and also the effect Shock, which says when targeting champions, ability strikes and basic attacks will deal an additional physical damage equal to 4% of your maximum mana. The Archangel's Staff. AP per mana is increased, no longer grants ability haste or mana refund on cast. Spending mana without hitting a target no longer grants stacks. Mana per stack and transform threshold reduced, so much like the Muramana above. The previous version of Seraphs offered a power scaling option both offensively and defensively with its shield. We're shifting the Archangel's line to be purely offensive, a greedy option by focusing on its slacking mana and AP fantasy. Slacking mana? Hmm. It costs 3,000 gold. It uses a Tear of the Goddess, a needlessly large rod, a Sapphire Crystal, and a 1,000 gold to build. It has 60 ability power, 400 mana, and it has the ability Awe, which we've discussed previously, and Mana Charge, which, which we have also discussed previously, albeit it only uh, applies if you actually hit something with the ability that you fire. Then there's the Seraph's Embrace. It no longer grants ability haste or mana refund on cast, and it no longer grants a shield, but it has AP per mana increased and grants mana per AP. Seraphs now gives purely offensive stats as a scaling item for mages. Instead of an on-demand shield, which allowed Seraphs to provide both offensive and defensive options, Seraphs now give more scaling AP and mana. It has 60 ability power and 850 mana, and it has an effect called Empyrean, which increases your total mana by 5% plus 2.5% per 100 AP that you have. That's going to be really fun on a Vigar. It also has Awe, which means it gains bonus ability power equal to 5% of maximum mana. Then there's the Lich Bane. Spellblade damage and cooldown increased. No longer grants mana or ability haste. Opening up Lich Bane to not just mana users by removing mana from Sheen and also giving it higher upfront damage at the cost of a slightly increased cooldown. It costs 3,000 gold. It builds from the Sheen, the Aether Wisp, the Blasting Wand, and 600 gold. It has 80 ability power and 10% movement speed. It also has Spellblade, which is an effect that we've discussed previously. Then there is the Blade of the Ruined King, and I wonder how he feels about everybody else running around with his sword all the time. Surely that will be awkward when he's added to the game. Who knows? It says that the movement speed active is now a passive instead. They wanted to retain this unique and iconic active effect, but needed to make some room for the actives and other more complex effects coming through from mythic items. So, it costs 3,100 gold, it uses the Vampiric Scepter, a recurve bow, a pickaxe, and 325 gold to build. It has 40 attack damage, 30 uh, attack speed, and 12% life steal. As for effects, it has one called Mist's Edge, which says that basic attacks apply physical damage equal to 10% or 6% of the target's current health, based on whether you're a, main, uh, you're a melee or a ranged champion. It also has an ability called Siphon, <clears throat> or, yeah, Siphon, which means that basic attacking champions three times will deal 40 to 120% uh, for 40 to 120 magic damage, rather, based on your level, and will steal 25% movement speed from that champion for two seconds. Then there's the Black Cleaver. It now deals missing health damage against fully stacked targets. No longer grants movement speed on hit. Black Cleaver did many things decently well, but if we wanted, to, but we wanted to do fewer things better, moved its movement speed granting effects to more movement-based items and replaced with an execution effect on targets you have fully shredded. It costs 3,300 gold. It uses the Coalfields Warhammer. 
Kindle Gem, Longsword, and 1050 gold to build. It gives you 300 health, 40 attack damage, and 25 ability haste. As for its effects, it has Carve, which says that dealing physical damage to a champion applies a stack of 4% armor reduction for up to si for 6 seconds, up to 6 stacks, which means a maximum of 24% armor reduction. It also has an effect called Butcher, which says that damaging attacks and abilities against fully shredded enemies deal an additional 5% of the target's missing health in physical damage, that is, damage over time. No, wait, rather. Damaging attacks and abilities against fully shredded enemies deal an additional 5% of the target's missing health in physical damage. Damage over time effects will deal 2% missing health instead on a half second cooldown. Then there is the Ravenous Hydra. Cleave now also procs on abilities and ranged basic attacks. Now grants Omnivamp instead of Lifesteal. No longer grants health regeneration and its active has been removed. Its active has been rehomed in Gore Drinker, a fighter mythic with room for an, an effect of this complexity and power. Ravenous Hydra has been simplified to become THE vamp item for physical damage casters or basic attackers. It has 3300 gold as a total cost. Its build path uses the Tiamat, the Vampiric Scepter, Coalfield's Warhammer, and 100 gold. It has 65 attack damage, 20 ability haste, and 15% omnivamp. As for its effects, it has Cleave, which means that basic attacks and abilities deal up to 60% of your attack damage to other enemies near the target. Damage scales down with distance from target, only once per ability. Then there's the Titanic Hydra, which will grant you attack damage based on health. Cleave now also procs on abilities and ranged basic attacks, no longer grants health regen, and its active has been removed. Shaping Titanic Hydra to be a bridge between heavy tank builds and fighter builds, some power taken out of its on hit and moved to raw AD to give it a home with champions who don't attack as often, but still like attack damage. It costs 3,300 gold total. It has a build path of the Tiamat, the Ruby Crystal, the Giant's Belt, and 800 gold. It gives you 500 health and 30 attack damage. As for effects, it has a passive called Colossus, which gain gives you bonus attack damage equal to 1% of your maximum health. Fun on a Cho'Gath if you want to go AD with him for some reason. It also has Cleave, which means that basic attacks, as we mentioned before, will deal physical damage equal to 4 plus 1.5% of your maximum health to the target and 40 plus 3% of your max health to enemies behind the target. That's at 75% damage for ranged champions. Then there's the Wit's End, which will grant movement speed on hit instead of healing. With a few more healing items, uh, healing options in the mythic space, we had to be judicious with other sources of healing. Replace the movement speed to offer light fighters like Fiora, Yi, Echo, etc. Another powerful form of utility. Now with more AD to broaden appeal among fighters. It costs 3,100 gold. It uses a hearthbound axe, a negatron cloak, a dagger, and 800 gold to build. Its attack damage is 30. It gives you 40% attack speed and 50 magic resistance. As for effects, it has Fray, which means that basic attacks will apply 15 to 80 based on your level, magic damage on hit, and grants you 20 movement speed for 2 seconds. The Maw of Malmortius, whose icon looks really quite lovely now with the update. The Lifeline Shield has been increased, bonus stats on proc have been removed. With more specialized healing options elsewhere, we wanted Maw to stand out as THE anti-magic burst item. It has a total cost of 3100 gold, it uses the Hex Drinker, Callfield's Warhammer, and 700 gold to build. It has 50 attack damage, 50 magic resistance, and 15 ability haste. As for its effects, it has Lifeline, which means that upon taking magic damage that will reduce your health below 30%, you will gain a 200 plus some percentage of your maximum health damage, magic damage shield for 5 seconds. That's on a 60 second cooldown, so no help against uh, AD casters for you. Death's Dance. The Omnivamp has been replaced with Bleed Cleanse, Movement Speed, and Heal on Takedown. Magic damage is no longer reduced and converted instead to Bleed. Death's Dance was the one-stop shop for everything fighters needed. AoE healing, mitigation against all damage sources, bonus damage, cooldown, etc. 
We still offer all these effects in the item shop, but the combination requires piecing together a few more purchases. Death's Dance is sharpening its role into the anti-physical damage item. As for its base stats, it costs 3100 gold total. It uses a chain vest, a coalfields warhammer, a pickaxe, and 325 gold to build. It has 50 attack damage, 40 armor, and 15 ability haste. As for its effects, it has something called Ignore Pain, which is at 35% for melee and 50% for ranged. A physical damage taken is dealt to you over 3 seconds instead of instantly. It also has an effect called Defy. Champion takedowns uh, cleanse Ignore Pain's remaining damage, granting you 30% movement speed for 2 seconds and restore 10% of your maximum health over the duration. That is going to be an absolute menace. Then there's Sterax Gauge, which I think has an unchanged icon, as far as I can tell. Its base shield has been decreased, but now scales with number of enemies in combat. It now grants healing based on enemies in combat. Tenacity removed, no longer melee only. Sterax is still your go-to optimal source for constant team fighting. If you're dueling, or in small skirmishes though, Death Stance or Maw will outshine it against physical and magic damage, respectively. It costs a total of 3100 gold. It uses a pickaxe, phage, and ruby crystal plus 20, uh, 725 gold to build. It has 400 health, 50 attack damage. As for effects, it has bloodlust. Dealing damage to or taking damage from a champion grants a stack, restoring 2% of your maximum health over 6 seconds at a maximum of 5 stacks, 1 per enemy champion. And the healing will be 60% as effective for ranged users. It also has Lifeline, which we've discussed before, but it works a little bit differently than the Maw of Malmortius. Upon taking damage that would reduce your health below 30%, you will gain a shield equal to 200 plus 8% of your max health per stacks of Rage on a 60 second cooldown, and the maximum health portion of the shield is 60% smaller for ranged users. Then there's the Randuin's Omen. Its active now also reduces enemy AD and crit damage. It now passively reduces damage taken from any basic attack, not just crits. It no longer reduces enemy attack speed when hit. Retooling Randuin's to better identify its effectiveness as a powerful defensive tool against all physical damage, and specifically, crit-based attacks. As for its base stats, it has a total cost of 2700 gold. It has a build path that includes the Warden's Mail, the Cloth Armor, the Kindle Gem, and 600 gold. It gives you 250 health, 80 armor, and 10 ability haste. It has an active called Humility, which will briefly slow nearby enemies and reduce their attack damage by 10% and critical strike damage by 20% for 4 seconds on a 1 minute cooldown. It will also reduce incoming damage from basic attacks by up to 0.5% of your maximum health, capped at 40% of the attack's damage. The Frozen Heart will now passively reduce damage taken from basic attacks. While Randuin's fills in the anti-crit space, Frozen Heart takes the same core effect, but retains its previous niche as an anti-attack speed item. Costs a total of 2700 gold. It builds from the Warden's Mail, the Glacial Shroud, 800 gold, and it gives you 400 mana, 80 armor, and 20 ability haste. It has an effect called Winter's Caress, which will reduce the attack speed of nearby enemies by 15%, and the same rock-solid passive as the Randuin's Omen above. Then there's the Gargoyle's Stone Plate. The active has been converted to a decaying shield. The passive grants resistances on taking damage. Reinforcing Gargoyle's Stone Plate as the ideal item for players who love to teamfight and tank entire teams. It costs a total of 3,300 gold to build. It uses the Aegis of the Legion, the Cloth Armor, and a Null Magic Mantle plus 1,050 uh, gold to build. It has 60 Armor, 60 Magic Resistance, and 15 Ability Haste. As for effects, it has one, an active, called Unbreakable, which will gain you a 100, 100 plus 100% 100 bonus health shield that decays over 2.5 seconds on a 90 second cooldown. It also has a passive called Fortify, which says that taking damage from a champion will grant you 3% bonus armor and 3% bonus magic resistance for 6 seconds, once per enemy champion, at a maximum of 15% bonus armor and magic resist. 
Then there's the Abyssal Mask. Its passive has been changed to increase damage on immobilized enemies. The Abyssal Mask now has a more streamlined use case and has been broadened to increase all damage to the target, not just magic. Its base stats uh, include a 2700 gold total cost. It uses a giant's belt, a negatron cloak, and 900 gold to build. It gives you 350 health and 60 magic resistance. As for effects, it has one called Unmake, which says that immobilizing a champion will cause them to take 10% increased damage for 4 seconds. Then there's the Thorn Mail, which I used to build on Ash once upon a time because the tutorial told me to. Its damage has been reduced. It will now apply improved Grievous Wounds upon immobilizing an enemy. On top of applying Grievous Wounds when hit, Thorn Mail now gives tanks a way to proactively apply the effects without waiting for enemies to attack. It costs 2700 gold. It uses the Bramble Vest and the Giant's Belt and 1000 gold to build. It uh, gives you 350 health, 60 armor, and it has an effect called Thorns, which says that when struck by an attack, you will deal 10 plus 10% of your bonus armor, magic damage to the attacker, and apply 40% Grievous wound for two, Wounds for 2 seconds if they are a champion. Immobilizing enemy champions also applies 60% Grievous Wounds for 2 seconds. Seek's Convergence will now grant bonus on-hit damage to your linked ally on targets that you have immobilized. Seek's previous effect was extremely powerful, but limited to small windows and was hard to appreciate. Updated the effect to be more easily accessible for beefier supports who want to lock down and protect their carries. It costs a total of 2400 gold. It uses a Kindle Gem and a Glacial Shroud, plus 700 gold to build. It gives you 300 health, 250 mana, and 30 armor with 20 ability haste rounding out the stat line. It has an effect called Conduit, which is an active that allows you to designate an accomplice on a 60 second cooldown. It also has a passive called Convergence. For 4 seconds after you immobilize an enemy, your accomplice's attacks and ability hits apply an additional 25 to 50 plus 1.5% of your max health plus 77.5% of your AP magic damage to that enemy. The Knight's Vow has been updated to say that the damage redirect increased. Now grants movement speed toward low health partners. No longer grants armor, passive movement speed towards partner, or heals the partner from damage. Moving Knight's Vow in the Warden niche by increasing the health and damage redirection on the item. A sharper movement speed effect should also help allies swoop in to save the day for allies in peril. It costs a total of 2300 gold. It uses a crystalline brazier, a rejuvenation bead, a kindle gem, and 700 gold to build. It gives you 400 health, a base health regen of 300%, and gives you 10 ability haste. As for effects, it has an active called Pledge, which allows you to designate an ally who is worthy on a 60 second cooldown. It also has a passive called Sacrifice, which says that while your worthy ally is nearby, redirect 15% of damage they take to you. And if they have less than 50% health, gain 35% movement speed when running towards them. Then there's the Morellonomicon. It will now grant access to improved Grievous Wounds. It no longer grants magic penetration. Making Morello a pure anti-healing item rather than a mixed purpose confusing item so that you won't have to use your advanced math degree to determine optimal damage. It costs a total of 2500 gold. It gives, it's built from a Blasting Wand, an Oblivion Orb, a ruby crystal, and 450 gold. It has 70 ability power and 250 health. As for its effects, it has a passive called Affliction, which says that dealing magic damage applies 40% Grievous Wounds to enemy champions for 2 seconds. If the target is below half health, this effect is increased to 60% Grievous Wounds. Then there's the Sanguine Blade, now provides physical vamp instead of lifesteal. We're promoting Sanguine Blade's lifesteal into the new physical vamp stat, so ability-heavy assassins can benefit from its sustain as well, while they clear waves and champions. It costs 3,000 gold total. It uses the Serrated Dirk, the Vampiric Scepter, and 1,000 gold to build. It has 50 attack damage, 10 lethality, and 12% physical vamp. As for its effects, it has Frenzy which says that while near one or fewer visible enemy champions gain 8 lethality and 20-80% to 80 
based on your level, attack speed, decaying over three seconds if other enemy champions get too close. And so we come to legendary items that have had balance changes. Some items are only being returned to fit into preseason. The biggest change you'll find in any of the sections below is the addition or removal of stat types, but not entire unique effects, with Mikhail's regen granting harmony passive as an exception. As with the other legendaries, keep in mind that mythic passives add additional stats that aren't listed here, so things that look like flat nerfs are at least in part adjusting for that extra power. Support items. Legendary. Fully support upgraded support items count as legendaries. The Rapid Fire Cannon has had its cost increased to 2700 gold, the attack speed has been buffed to 35%, and the critical strike chance has been turned down to 20%. And that's a pattern that's going to repeat across a lot of the uh, legendary items, that the critical strike chances have been nerfed a little bit, and changes to other stats have happened. The Storm Racer is down to 2700 gold, but it's also lost 10 attack damage and 5% or 15% attack speed, putting it down to attack damage 40 and attack speed 15. The Mercurial Scimitar is down from 3400 to 2900 gold and has had its build path changed a bit. Now it's a Quicksilver Sash, Cloak of Agility, and a Pickaxe, plus 125 gold. The attack damage is down to 30, the magic resistance is down to 30, it has a 20% critical strike chance added, but the lifesteal has been fully removed. It also removes all disables, excluding Airborne, which is not really a change to it, but something that's been updated in its tooltip. Runan's Hurricane has gone up to 3,400 gold, and its build path has changed into Pickaxe, Seal, Dagger, and 1,025 gold. It now adds 25 attack damage, but its critical strike chance, like many of the other uh, legendaries, has been adjusted down to 20%. Its move speed bonus has also gone down from 9 to 7%, and its bolt damage has been changed from 40% total attack damage from 40 to 70 total attack damage from levels 10 to 18. Rhylai's Crystal Scepter costs 3,000 now, and its build path has been changed to Blasting Wand, Giant's Belt, Amplifying Tome, and 815 gold. It also has 90 ability power, as ever, and its health has been changed from 300 to 350, and its slow has been increased to 30%. Nasher's Tooth has not changed in cost, but it has been changed in its build path to a Recurve Bow, a Blasting Wand, an Amplifying Tome, and 715 gold. Its ability power has been buffed to 100, but the cooldown reduction has been reduced, and the on-hit damage has been changed from a 0.15 AP ratio to a 0.25 AP ratio. The Bloodthirster has dropped 100 gold and cost to 3400, and the build path has been changed a little bit. Now it's a BF Sword, a Cloak of Agility, a Vampiric Scepter, and 600 gold. Its attack damage has been substantially nerfed, down from 80 to 55, but it now has a critical strike chance of 20%. The Edge of Night has not changed cost, but its build path is now the Serrated Dirk, Longsword, Ruby Crystal, and 1,050 gold. The attack damage has gone down from 55 to 50. Yumo's Ghostblade has gone up 1,000 gold to 3,000, and is now built from the Serrated Dirk, Pickaxe, and 1,025 gold. The attack damage has been increased to 60, but the cooldown reduction has been fully removed. The Umbral Glaive has gone up to 2800 gold, and is now built from a Serrated Dirk, Caulfield's Warhammer, and 600 gold. Its attack damage is up to 55, but its cooldown reduction has been changed to 15 ability haste. The Guardian Angel is mostly unchanged, it has had a slight nerf to its attack damage, but otherwise nothing has really been done to it. Warmog's Armor is more expensive now at 3,000 gold. It has uh, had its cooldown reduction changed to Ability Haste, of course, like the other items. And Warmox Heart, deal uh, instead of healing 2.5% max health per half second, it now heals 5% max health per second, which changes like the ticks and the moments in which Warmox is going to give you health back. Spirit Visage has gone up from 28 to 2,900 gold. It has lost 15 magic resistance, but uh, converts its ability haste from cooldown reduction into, you know, ability haste. It also increases shielding and healing by 25%, which is down a little bit for the healing uh, from 30%. Dead Man's Plate has not changed its cost, but its build path has changed. The Winged Moonplate, the Ruby Crystal, and the Chainmail Vest plus 900 gold is now needed. 
It gives you 50 more health at 475, but slightly less armor at 40 instead of 60. It does offer a 5% movement speed buff, however. The Ardent Sensor has not changed cost, but its build path has changed a little bit. It's now built from the Forbidden Idol, the Blasting Wand, and 650 gold. The cooldown reduction and movement speed has been removed, but the base mana regen is up from 50 to 100%. The Redemption has increased in cost to 2300 gold and is now built from the Kindle Gem, Forbidden Idol, and 700 gold. Its heal shield power is up to 20% from 10. It has converted its CDR to Ability Haste. It no longer gives any base health regen, and its base mana regen has been reduced. And Judgment no longer damages minions or gets three times effectiveness from heal and shield power. Mikhail's Blessing has been changed from Mikhail's Crucible, it costs 2300 gold now, and is built from the Forbidden Idol, Negatron Cloak, and 600 gold. It gives 50 ma magic resist up from 40, and has converted its, its CDR to Ability Haste. Concentrated Quicksilver has also been changed uh, a little bit. It now removes all crowd control debuffs except airborne and suppression from an allied champion and restores 100 to 200 health depending on allied level on a 120 second cooldown. It no longer grants bonus health regen equal to mana regen. Magi's Soul Stealer has gone up from 1400 gold to 1600 and has had its mana bonus completely removed. In compensation though, it does give you 100 extra health now. Zonya's Hourglass has gone up by 500 gold to 2500. Its ability power has been nerfed from 75 to 65 and its ability haste has been converted from CDR. Banshee's Veil is down 500 from a 3,000 gold cost to 2,500, and is now built from the Fiendix Codex, Fiendish Codex, the Verdant Barrier, for and 400 gold. It provides 65 ability power down from 75, and 45 magic resist down from 60. And of course, like everything else, it has had its CDR converted to ability haste. Now let's talk about jungle item changes. We want junglers to be able to engage with the item system instead of being forced to purchase the same dull item every game, especially with the mythic item system making your first item so important. We're taking cues from last year's well-received update to support items and letting junglers progress towards their smite without having to spend more money. That puts them on even footing with the other four positions in terms of being able to start on their mythic right away. Also. We snuck some jungle camp changes into this section so junglers can process everything specific to the role in one place. You're welcome, or we're sorry, depending on whether that helped or confused you personally. So, the Hail Blade is the blue one. It costs 350 gold, it gives Omni Vamp against monsters at 12%, it has the Tooth and Nail buff, meaning that it damaging monsters but burns them for 60 plus your AP, some of your AP ratio, plus your bonus health, plus your bonus AD in some percentages, magic damage over 5 seconds. It also has the Chilling Path, which means smiting 5 times consumes this item and upgrades your smite to Chilling Smite. It has the Huntsman bonus, which means killing large monsters grants bonus experience, and the Leyline Walker buff, which means you regen up to 8 to 18 mana from level 1 to 18 per second when in the jungle or the river. Then there's the Chilling Smite, of course, which is used against champions. When smiting champions, Chilling Smite deals 20 to 156 true damage and steals 20% of their movement speed for 2 seconds. The Ember Knife is the red one, and we're also cleaning up Challenging Smite to make it a little bit more intuitive. It too costs 350, it has the Omnivamp against monsters, Tooth and Nail, Huntsman, and Leyline Walker, but it also has Challenging Path, which means smiting five times will upgrade your smite to Challenging Smite. And Challenging Smite, again, is the smite you use against champions. When smiting champions, Challenging Smite marks them for 4 seconds. During this time, your damaging attacks and abilities deal 48 to 125 bonus true damage to them over 2.5 seconds, refreshing, but not stacking. And you take 20% reduced damage from the smited enemy. Abilities now apply and refresh the burn alongside basic attacks. Immolating Smite's damage reduction now has VFX, and display is the amount reduced as combat text. Then there's some jungle camp adjustments. Overall, our aim is to slightly improve pathing diversity and make the camps feel distinct. We are running a consistency pass to remove some arcane optimizations and rules that aren't apparent in the game. Gromp and Scuttle, in particular, are getting changes to emphasize their unique identities. 
In Scuttle's case, she'll also be a little less costly to lose, since you're not losing a chunk of sustain. So, the Gromp's magic resistance has been changed from a scaling system to being 20 at all levels, and its health has been substantially nerfed from 2100 to 3450 to 1650 to 2460, depending on level. Toad Rage, which was the Gromp's first three attacks dealing increased damage, has also been removed. Instead, it has a new passive called Toad Soup, which means that killing the Gromp restores 50 plus 10 times your average champion level across your team, health, and 30 plus 6 times average champion level mana, increased by up to 100% based on the killer's missing health and mana, respectively, i.e. the lower health you are, the more it will restore you. Its attack damage has been increased substantially, um, from 70 to 259 to 80 to 253. Wait, hang on, that's, a, that's kind of a nerf at higher levels, actually. Hm, interesting. The Blue Sentinel has had its armor changed also. No longer does the armor scale, no longer does the magic resist scale, they are both 20 at all levels. Its health has also been nerfed substantially, but its movement speed has gone up. The Greater Murkwolf has had its armor changed to 20 at all levels and has gained magic resist that it didn't have before. Its health has also been nerfed slightly, but its movement speed too has been increased. Same thing goes for the Murkwolves, the Crimson Raptors, the Lesser Raptors, and the Red Brambleback. The Ancient Krug, the Krug itself, and the Lesser Krug have all had similar changes in terms of just how they're put together usually, meaning uh, increases to their movement speed and changes to exactly how much experience and gold they give you. Lesser Krugs have had a new passive added to them, Nuggets, shine gold to properly reflect their gold experience and experience value, so Lesser Krugs will look golden now. The Rift Scuttler has had substantial changes, its armor and magic resist is down from 60 to 20 each, and its health has gone down from 1200 to uh, 2560 to 1000 to 2066, depending on level. It spawns with a 60% max health shield, and that shield will break when it's immobilized. This is called the Loose Carapace um, passive. In return, a couple of things have been removed. The Crab Soup uh, passive, which increased or restored your health and mana, has been reduced, uh, or rather removed. And the Rift Scuttler no longer loses resistance or takes increasing damage after being immobilized. That whole mechanic has been replaced with a shield. Moving on to Epic Items. Epic Items are the tier below Legendary. They're mid-tier components of Legendary and Mythic items that build out of basic items. We're ensuring they serve their role as valuable building blocks, offering incremental stats and effects that smooth your progression toward bigger purchases. Like the legendaries, we're providing blank slate presentations of these epics to give you a clean read on when you'll want to pick them up. New and updated have been mixed together, since there aren't as many. A new item is called the Noon Quiver. And the context says that marksman champions suffer from awkward early game components that leave them missing either attack damage or attack speed, both of which are critical for them to feel powerful. So we created Noon Quiver, an epic that specifically builds into marksman mythics and features both stats. Noon Quiver also amplifies marksman PvE capabilities to provide the early lane management marksman champions crave without sending their PvP power over the top. Lastly, by giving it a smooth build path out of smaller parts, it avoids the lane snowballing issue BF Sword had if you were forced to back before saving up 1300 gold. The Noon Quira costs 1300 gold, it builds from the longsword dagger and another longsword and 300 gold. It has 30 attack damage and 15% attack speed. It also has the effect of precision, which means attacks will deal an additional 20 physical damage to minions and monsters. Then we have the Rage Knife giving on-hit champs the flexibility to access Ginsu's new crit-converting effect without completing Rage Blade itself so they can spec into critical chance items first, if the situation calls for it. It has a total cost of 800 and is built from 2 daggers and 200 gold and gives you 25% attack speed. It also has the Wrath effect from Ginsu's Rage Blade, which means attacks apply 35 physical damage on hit per 20% of your critical strike chance, but you can no longer critical strike. Then there's the Blighting Jewel. Percent Armor Penetration has Last Whisper as a component, adding Blighting Jewel to establish build path parity for percent magic penetration. It costs 1250, it's built from an Amplifying Tome and 815 gold. It has 25 ability power and 15% magic penetration. 
Then we have another new item, the Leeching Leer. One of the new building blocks of the system for mages who want to deal and heal. It costs 1300. It uses a ruby crystal, an amplifying tome, and 465 gold for its build path. It gives you 20, uh, 150 health, 20 ability power, and 10% omnivamp. Then there's the Oblivion Orb, which says that giving mages earlier access to grievous wounds, like physical damage dealers get from Executioner's Calling. Orb is losing its flat penetration to get this effect. It costs 800, it is built from an amplifying tome and 365 gold. It grants you 30 ability power, and dealing magic damage will apply 40% grievous wounds to champions for 2 seconds. Then there's the Seeker's Arm Guard, which has been simplified and made a little bit cheaper. It now costs 900 gold. It is built from the Cloth Armor and Amplifying Tome and 165 gold. It has 30 ability power, 15 armor, and killing a unit will grant one armor, stacking up to 30 times. The Hextech Alternator has been opened up to be less restrictive on who can take and use it. The damage proc now applies to abilities too. It costs a total of 1,050 gold. It is built from an amplifying tome, another amplifying tome, and 180 gold. It gives you 40 ability power, and damaging an enemy champion will deal an additional 50 to 125 magic damage on a 40 second cooldown. Bami's Cinder has had some changes. The center point of tank mythics now scales better early, though it loses its bursty immob immobilize proc in exchange. Its total cost has been changed to 1,000 gold. The ru it's built from two ruby crystals and 200 gold. Health is 300, and its immolate passive says the following. Deal 15 plus 1% bonus health magic damage per second to nearby enemies, which is increased 50% against minions and 100% against monsters. Now we have the winged moon plate. We didn't have a movement speed plus health component. Now we do. It costs 800, it it's made from a ruby crystal and 400 gold, it gives you 150 health, and grants you 5% movement speed. We have another new item, the Verdant Barrier, which will give you an MR equivalent to Seeker's Arm Guard, so that when you need to survive a difficult ability power lane, you have options. It costs 1200, it's built from the Null Magic Mantle and Amplifying Tome and 315 gold. It'll give you 25 ability power, 25 magic resistance, and every 60 seconds you will gain 3 magic resist of up to a maximum of 15. Taking magic damage from champions reduces the time until the next increase by 5% of the damage taken. For example, taking 100% magic damage will reduce the time until the next tick by 5 seconds. The Warden's Mail has been changed to something more selfish and noticeable by the owner. It costs a thousand, it builds from two cloth armors and 400 gold, and it'll give you 40 armor. It has the passive Rock Solid, which we've talked about before, which reduces the incoming damage from basic attacks by 0.5% bonus health capped at 40% of the basic attack's damage. The Phage has been changed into a health scaling epic that will help fighters beef up in longer fights. Its old passive is moving to a new item, look down a few lines. It costs 1100 gold, it builds from a ruby crystal and a longsword and 350 gold, it has 15 attack damage and 200 health. It also has the passive Sturdy. After you deal damage to a champ, physical damage to a champion rather, restore 2% or 1% depending on whether you're melee or ranged, of your maximum health over 6 seconds. Then we have the Hearthbound Axe, and the Hearthbound for the lore hounds out there are the people who live in the Frail Yord who are not Iceborne. Home to Phage's old passive, our new, more agility-themed weapon offers movement speed on hit and builds into several items that do the same. It costs 1100 gold, it builds from a dagger and a longsword, and 450 gold, it gives you 15 attack damage, 15 attack speed, and the nimble passive, which means that attacking a unit will grant you 20 if you're melee, or 10 if you're ranged, movement speed for 2 seconds. Then we have the Tiamat. And it says, we're splitting up Tiamat's passive and active to let each take on more of a center stage role as separate components. Tiamat is keeping the passive, the active is moving to a new item just below. It costs 1200, it is built from a pickaxe and 325 gold, and it has 25 attack damage and the passive cleave, which means that your attacks will deal up to 60% total attack damage physical to other nearby enemies. The Iron Spike Whip 
is made up of Tiamat's previous active. Tiamat's active and passives were split up to let each item take more of a center stage in their respective field. Iron Spike Whip inherited Tiamat's active. It too costs 1200, it's built from pickaxe and 325 gold, it has 30 attack damage, and gives you the active Crescent, which lets you deal 75% total attack damage physical damage to nearby enemies. Minions and monsters below 50% health take double damage on a 15% cooldown affected by ability haste. Then we have another new item, the Bandle Glass Mirror, which seems to be some kind of Yordle themed item, actually. Filling a hole in the system so that mana regen items with ability haste aren't 100% bound to heal and shield power. It costs 1050 gold, it has a build path of the Fairy Charm, the Amplifying Tome, and 365 gold. It will give you 20 ability power, 10 ability haste, and 50% mana regen. We are now a little bit more than halfway through this extensive list of preseason updates, and if you would like to prove to me that you actually managed to pay attention through the whole thing, then if you leave a comment down below, let me know the number of your favorite Star Wars movie. I won't judge, and I don't care m much which one it is, but just a little marker to let me know that, hey, you're one of the special club who actually managed to stay awake through the whole thing. Anyway, let's talk about epic item balance changes. Like legendaries, some epics are getting simple tuning passes based on how we want you to build into the new and updated legendary and mythic items. The seal is down from 1400 to 1200 gold total cost. Its attack speed has been increased by 6% up to 18, and the critical strike chance has gone down to 15%. Executioner's Calling has lost a little bit of duration on Grievous Wounds, down to 2 seconds from 3. The Sheen costs 700 gold, down from 1050 now, and is built not from a mana crystal and 700 gold, but just 700 gold straight up. It no longer grants mana or cooldown reduction. The Giant's Belt is down by 100 from 1000 to 900 and gives you 350 health rather than 380. The Negatron Cloak is up from 720 to 900 gold and gives you 50 magic resistance rather than just 40. The Spectre's Cowl has had its cost changed to 1250, up from 1200, so not, not much of a change there. The Aegis of the Legion, on the other hand, is now up to 1500 gold, but has gained Ability Haste 10 in return. The Quicksilver Sash has been updated to say that the disables that it can remove excludes Airborne. Forbidden Idol has had its build path changed to one Fairy Charm and 550 gold, although the total cost of building the item apparently remains unchanged. It now gives you 10% heal and shield power, but no longer provides any cooldown reduction or ability haste. Finally, we have our basic starter and support items, the ones that don't have components of their own. The Tear of the Goddess has been moved into a starting item space to serve as a greedy scaling option for spellcasters. The stacking mechanic has been changed to discourage empty spell spamming and encourage opportunistic trading. Its total cost has been turned uh, to 400 gold, it grants 150 mana, and attacks will deal an additional 5 physical damage to minions. It has mana charge, which means that if you strike a target with an ability, you will consume a charge and gain 3 bonus mana up to a maximum of 450 bonus mana. Bonus mana is doubled if the target is a champion. You can gain a new mana charge every 8 seconds up to a maximum of 4. The Dark Seal has been made into a better option for those who don't need mana, and unbinding its strength from potions. Its ability power is 15, health is 40, and champion assists and kills will grant you uh, 1 and 2 stacks of glory respectively. Up to 10 stacks, you will lose 4 stacks on death. Glory will grant you 5 extra ability power per stack of glory. Doran's Blade has been changed, slightly broadening our starting item options so they're more favorable to those who use more spells and have mixed damage types. It now gives 8 attack damage, 80 health, and will grant 2.5% Omnivamp. Doran's Ring has been opened up to non-mana users and has brought back the last old last hitting skill test. It grants 15 ability power, 70 health, and killing a minion will restore 6 mana. Excess mana, all 6 of it if you can't gain mana, is converted to healing at a 50% rate. Now there's a few changes to basic and starter items. The Cloak of Agility has gone down in cost from 800 to 600, and the Critical Strike Chance has changed from 20 to 15. The Fairy Charm, on the other hand, has gone up from 125 to 250, but also grants double the mana regen at 50%. Support item balance changes have happened as well. 
To ensure support builds are influenced similarly by their mythic passives as other roles, we're counting the fully upgraded forms as legendaries, but reducing their innate stats so they don't become more powerful in the process. We're also buffing spoils of war and tribute so supports can bring their mythics online closer to everyone else. Fully support uh, upgraded support items will now count as legendaries, and in Spoils of War, you will gain a charge every 35 rather than 45 seconds, and Tribute will grant 20 gold per proc rather than 15. The Pauldrons of White Rock have had their health changed to down to 250 from 300. The Bulwark of the Mountain, same story, health is down from 300 to 250, and its ability power is down from 25 to 20. The Shard of True Ice now only grants 75 health down from 100 and 40 ability power down from 50, while the Black Mist Scythe is down from 100 to 75 and gives 20 damage rather than 25. The Plated Steel Caps um, has been changed from the Ninja Tabi. A long, long time ago, Ninja Tabi granted Dodge Chance, allowing users to sometimes avoid basic attacks entirely. That stopped being the case in uh, Check's Notes 2012. We're finally catching up and re-theming these boots, so the Ninja Tabi are now the plated steel caps. Some items have also been removed, quite a few of them, in fact. Last on the list for our items world tour is paying respects to the items leaving the shop. The Hextech GLP 800 is gone, it's now a mythic item called Everfrost. This one is not as much a uh, one-to-one -one mythification like the others, since Everfrost's active is more defensive and less pick-oriented. If you're looking for a slow cone, though, you'll find a familiar toy here with some extra use cases. Luden's Echo has become a mythic item, Luden's Tempest. Leandra's Torment has become Leandri's Anguish. Hextech Protobelt is now the Hextech Rocket Belt. The Sunfire Cape is the Sunfire Aegis. The, right the Righteous Glory is the Turbo Chem Tank. The Iceborne Gauntlet is the Frostfire Gauntlet. The Duskblade of Drakthar is now a mythic. The Trinity Force is now a mythic. Shirelia's Reverie is now a mythic item called Shirelia's Battle Song. The Locket of the Iron Solari has become a mythic. The Adaptive Helm is gone. The helm was too niche, only countering a few champions, but to a major degree. Also, it didn't feel powerful, even when it was. Athene's Unholy Grail is gone as well. It was constantly a mandatory item for certain champions and gave much more power than we could support. The Frozen Mallet, too, has lost its life. Mallet was either much too nice when balanced or way too strong when purchased by more than one or two champions. The Hextech Gunblade is gone. It completely overwhelmed build options for a small pool of champions but saw very little use outside of that pool. It was also one of the more frustrating items in the shop. Spellbinder is gone. It was hard to use well, and hard to know whether you used it well. The Rod of Ages 2 has been vanished. The Rod of Ages timescaling fantasy didn't feel impactful on a mythic for a first purchase, and didn't feel realistic as a later purchase. It also overlapped in fantasy with Archangels, but was the less exciting of the two. Static Shiv is gone as well. The Static Shiv's chain lightning effect was either underwhelming when balanced, or too strong when it felt good. Twin Shadows was too powerful, and playstyle warping when tuned to be pur purchasable. Yarim's Fist is also gone. Unlike Seeker's Arm Guard, whose armor stacking mechanic gives physical damage dealers a window to fight mages in lane before full stacks, the health stacking mechanic on Yarim's isn't doing anything valuable. It's been largely replaced with a new Phage as a health AD component. The Chalice of Harmony is gone as well. Chalice was redundant with other mana epics that were filling out the shop, especially with the removal of Athenes. The other options were more needed for recipes. The Bilgewater Cutlass has lost its life. Actives are high mind share, so culling them in places they weren't doing exciting things seemed to work well. The Blade of the Ruined King lost this active and Hextech Gunblade was removed, so Cutlass no longer had a reason to have an active, which was the main reason it existed to begin with. The Catalyst of Aeons, finally, is the last victim of this patch. It offered early access to the Eternity passive, previously held by Rod of Ages and Abyssal Mask. With Rod's removal and Mask's update, the Eternity passive is gone, and Catalyst no longer has a role to fill. Fortunately, it will still live on, I think, in Legends of Runeterra. Now, let's talk about runes. Conqueror has been streamlined as a damage-oriented rune by shifting its power from sustain to adaptive force. So, adaptive force stacks have been increased to 2.2 to 5 at levels 1 to 18, with 24 to 60 at maximum stacks. The healing at maximum stacks has been decreased um, 
from 15% with 8% for ranged champions to 9% with 6 for ranged champions. Legend Bloodline has been toned back a little bit, toning back the overall sustain of Legend Bloodline as its lifesteal was dominating the choice structure within the precision tree and having a bigger impact on rune and item builds than a minor rune should, allowing champs to delay or altogether forego sustain passives. It has had its stacks nerfed and its lifesteal decreased. Ravenous Hunter, similar to Bloodline and Conqueror, lowering the overall amount of free sustain within the rune system to open up more choices within the rune and item systems. Its healing has been changed to Omnivamp, gaining a plus 2% per Bounty Hunter stack. Presence of Mind has had, to, has, uh, had itself tuned as well. Presence of Mind's permanent stats were single-handedly single solving resource issues, we are reworking the rune to be more in line with other minor runes and tailored towards champions who prefer sustained combat. Its effect now says that damaging an enemy champion increases your mana regeneration by 1.5 to 11 at an 80% rate for ranged based on your level. Mana per second for 4 seconds. That's a clunky phrase to say. Energy users will gain 1.5 energy per second instead. Takedowns restore 15% of your maximum mana or energy. Transcendence is updated to still provide for spell-happy casters and anyone else in need of a little boost while fitting into the new uncapped haste system. It now says that it will gain bonuses upon reaching the following levels. At level 5, it gains 5 ability haste. The same thing happens at level 8. And at level 11, on champion takedown, you will reduce the remaining cooldown of basic abilities by 20%. Cosmic Insight, similar to Transcendence, has been changed and updated to function in the new haste system. The rune is now more streamlined to focus on the item haste and summoner spell haste to reduce some of the low-cost haste in the rune system. It no longer increases your CDR cap or grants CDR. It will give you 10 item haste, applying to all item cooldowns, and 15 summoner spell haste. Ingenious Hunter has been updated to work with the haste system, as well as been broadening its use case to all items with cooldowns, so it should feel a little bit more usable than before. Now you gain 10 item haste plus 5 per bounty hunter stack, and item haste affects all item cooldowns, not just passives. The ability haste rune stat uh, had to scale up over time to avoid letting champions reach the cap too quickly. Now that we're using ability haste, it gets to provide more immediate benefit. It now grants 8 ability haste right up front, rather than 1-10% to CDR. Time Warp Tonic has had a clarity update, as the cooldown in consumables was occasionally confusing to players for a minor rune. It no longer puts the consumable on a short cooldown. If consumables are stacked, the instant restoration is applied after the duration of the initial consumable ends. Now we reach the exciting stuff. Champion preseason adjustments, which is always the math that's most fascinating. Caitlyn's headshot damage from crit chance has been decreased. The math behind this is super gross. I agree, math is very gross. But the gist is that headshot's bonus damage scales off Infinity Edge's crit damage in a way that completely ignored preseason's systemic crit damage reduction. We're baking that systemic change into Headshot's calculations, though Kate is still arguably buffed relative to other marksmen, since the new IE's greater maximum crit damage increase washes out most of this nerf at full build. Her passive has been changed, uh, not from levels, but Headshot damage from critical chance has been changed to 1.25 times 87.5 plus half of your bonus critical damage percent times critical chance percent AD. Whatever the heck that means. Jin's passive critical damage reduction and critical chance has been decreased. We still want Jin's crits to feel noticeably different from his non-crits, so we're nerfing the AD he gets from critical chance instead of his crit damage. His passive whisper now says that 14% uh, crits deal 150 his critical damage reduction is 14%, but crits still deal 150% ability uh, attack damage. Critical chance to AD conversion has gone down from 40% to 30%. Senna has had her passive crit damage reduction and crit chance per 20 souls decreased. R now collects mist wraiths on cast. Bringing Senna into the crit system by having her crits happen less, but hit even stronger than before. Her passive Absolution has had its crit damage reduction changed from 14%, uh, from 35% to 14%. Her criticals will now deal 150% AD rather than 130. Her critical chance per 20 souls has also gone down from 15 to 10. 
Dawning Shadow will now collect Mist Wraiths, but they still only spawn near Senna, so no picking it up cross map. Trindamir's passive crit chance has been flattened, making sure that he doesn't waste stats at max fury with his crit build. So his crit chance per fury point has been changed from a scaling uh, to a flat 0.4%. Yasuo's passive now converts critical stri tr strike chance above 100% to bonus AD. Now that the critical system offers more interesting options and comes in 20% increments, we wanted to make sure that Yasuo wasn't wasting stats or getting locked out of exciting items because of his passive. His passive, Way of the Wanderer, now has an overcapped passive attached to it, a passive with more passives. It's just what we need. A critical strike chance above 100% is converted into 0.5 bonus AD per 1% additional critical strike chance. Reminder, Way of the Wanderer doubles crit chance from other sources. Yone has had a similar change. Passive now converts crit strike chance above 100% to bonus AD. Pretty much the same as Yasuo's. Akali's Q costs have been decreased at later levels, adjusting for the loss of Hextech Gunblade and Presence of Mind's increased energy pool. It now costs 120 down to 80 energy as you level it up. Katarina's passive E and R will now apply on hit effects. Oh no. R will now deal hybrid damage and scale with attack speed. With the loss of Gunblade and the lack of hybrid damage among mythics, Katarina needed help to keep her identity as an assassin in the new item system. We're helping her adapt to the new shop by further differentiating AD and AP Katarina builds, adding new scaling hooks that let her access the on hit system. The Katarina you know and love is still here, but without Gunblade dictating her build, her daggers might not look the same every time you see her. Her passive veracity means that her dagger slashes apply on-hit effects, Shunpo applies on-hit effects, and the Death Lotus applies on-hit effects at 25% efficiency, and also grants uh, physical damage at 15% plus 9.9% attack speed bonus AD per dagger, and the magic of her... Yeah, the magic ratio on her uh, daggers have been changed a little bit down from 22% to 19%. Kale's passive bonus attack speed now scales with AP. The landscape around Kale is shifting dramatically, and AP Kale in particular may take a while to find replacements for previous favorites like Hextech Gunblade. We're lending AP builds some aid and ensuring that both forms of Kale can hyperscale into the late game. Her passive Divine Ascent now grants 6% plus 2% AP per Enrage stack. In bonus attack speed, that is. Orn. Masterworks now upgrade Mythics. Orn now gains increased bonus health in addition to armor and magic resist. Bonus defense is now increased per Masterwork he creates. We're tying Orn's Masterwork system into the Mythic system, opening up build diversity for both him and his allies by ensuring everyone can get an upgrade no matter their build. We're also giving Orn some smithy power, now that he only gets to upgrade one of his own items. Passive Living Forge has been changed from a curated list to all mythic items. Masterwork upgrade values has changed. It, now, instead of depending on items, it's now around a thousand gold, apparently. The masterwork limit is one for Orn and his allies, since Orn is still subject to the one mythic limit. Now there's a stat bonus change though, rather than gaining an additional 10% bonus armor and magic resistance, Orn gains bonus health armor and magic resistance at 10% each. He also has a new passive on the passive called Calloused Hands, which means he gains an additional 4% bonus health, armor, and magic resist for each mythic item he upgrades into a masterwork, which is quite a good little bonus when uh, sc scattered all around an entire team. Victor's Hex Core has been removed. He now upgrades his abilities by earning champion takedowns and last hits. E damage has been increased, and mana growth has been increased, making Victor embrace and engage with the new itemization system while also giving him a bit more oomph now that his Hex Core isn't there to amp him up. His base stats have been changed, his mana growth is now 45, up from 10 to 5, and uh, his passive has had substantial changes, with a new passive on the passive called Harvest. Victor will harvest one Hex Fragment from minion and monster kills, five from large minion kills, and 25 from champion takedowns. He can spend 100 Hex Fragments to upgrade a basic ability. Once all three basic abilities have been upgraded, Chaos Storm is upgraded automatically. No word on whether killing Skarner will instantly upgrade any of his abilities. His Death Ray, the E, has had its ratio increased to 70%, and the Aftershock ratio increased to 80%. 
Then there's some champion mana adjustments. Between the mana changes to items like Tear Sheen, Lich Bane, and the lack of mana on most mythic items, we're giving the following champions a 20% increase to mana growth. Amuvu, An Amumu, Anivia, Camille, Cassiopeia, Cho'Gath, Corky, Darius, Echo, Ezreal, Fiora, Fizz, Gangplank, Hecarim, Irelia, Jax, Cassid, and Malphite, Nasus, Orn, Rise, Skarner, Silas, Twisted Fate, Udu, Vi, Victor, Volibear, Wukong, Sinshaw, Yorick, and Zillion. Now we move on to other champion changes. Brand. While our last changes helped bring B Brand back into the mid lane, he's a little too strong in average play for both mid and support dampening down his early game damage to bring him back in line. His passive Blaze has been changed a little bit. It now grants 10.4 to 14% explosion damage to marked enemies at levels 1 to 17 rather than levels 1 to 9. His E has had its cooldown changed, uh, buff increased by 2 seconds pretty much at all levels. Amumu, similar to Brand, we're focusing on knocking down some of the mummy's power in average play by pulling back on some of his durability, so his health growth has taken a small nerf from 84 to 80, and his armor from 33 to 30. Elise has had her build diversity opened up uh, with a new item system. Her Q, Venomous Bite, will now apply on-hit effects. And there's Seraphine, dear Seraphine. We're pushing the distinction between mid and support Seraphine. Mit Sarah, who will be higher level throughout the game, will have better access to scaling damage via the passive and Q changes, and can now use E more comfort comfortably for wave clear when needed. Support Sarah won't be able to hit those same levels or damage numbers, but will still be able to lean on E max to provide consistent CC for, for her team. Her base mana regen has been decreased to 8, and her note ratio has been uh, changed from 7.5% AP flat to 6 to 9% AP per level, scaling up over time. Her Q, the high note, has had its ratios changed a little bit. It now has a point... Yeah, it now has a scaling AP ratio rather than a flat AP ratio, and some of the base numbers have been changed a little bit. The beat drop, the E, has had its base damage uh, nerfed a little bit at higher levels, and damage to minions has been changed from a scaling system to 100% at all levels. Twitch's deadly venom damage and W slow will now scale with AP. Contaminate's AP scaling now deals magic damage. Following up a prior buff that didn't actually put AP Twitch anywhere near the mark of playability, these changes are geared towards a playstyle of quickly stacking deadly venom and detonating it, then rat tailing it out to reset. It'll scale worse than AD Twitch, who isn't sacrificing anything for these changes, by the way, and have less explosive openers with Spray and Prey than crit-based versions, but is hopefully, hopefully an exciting alternative option for Twitch players. Deadly Venom now has a damage ratio of 3 AP damage per second per stack at a max 108% AP for 6 stacks over 6 seconds. His Venom cast now has a slow ratio that depends on 6% the six, on 6 of his AP, and Contaminate's AP scaling damage has been changed to 33.3% AP magic damage per deadly poison stack, rather than physical damage. Volibear's passive now scales with AP. E deals more damage to minions in the late game. With AP fighter, fighter items coming into the game, we're polishing this bear's AP playstyle to be a little more viable. His extended fights and farming should be bumped up enough with these changes for Mage Bear to be a better opt-in option. So, the attack speed per stack on his passive, the Relentless Storm, has been changed from 5% flat to 5% plus 4% AP. The Sky Splitter has been changed uh, to do somewhat more damage to minions, pretty much across the board, but mostly at the later levels. Then we have something new, an incoming heal indicator. We originally billed this as a quality of life change, but have seen a bunch of questions, so let's talk about it now. For abilities and effects with delayed healing, it can be hard to know mid-fight how much health you or your opponent will get, leading to situations where you back out from a fight you could have won or stay in a fight you're about to lose. This change makes the, that decision clearer by indicating the amount of incoming heals on champion health bars. We're adjusting the visualization of this effect based on feedback so far, like toning down the brightness of the incoming health to make it easier to distinguish from current health. Let us know if you think further changes are needed. In 10.23, we add the indicator for Evelyn's passive Demon Shade, Karma's w, w Renewal, and Soraka's Q Starkle heal over time on both herself and when transferred to an ally via W Astral Infusion. 
And as a recap, we added the following in 10.22, Seraphine's W Surround Sound, Vladimir's R Hemo Plague, Redemption, and ARAM Health Packs. There's also been some adjustments to ARAM to account for the wider item rate changes that are happening. Game pacing and gold income has been changed. Nearby minions give you a little bit more gold, at 6 gold up from 5. Ambient gold and kill gold are both up by 10%. And alternating cannon, cannon waves uh, has been changed. Cannon, cannon minions will now spawn on both sides every other wave, starting at wave 3, instead of alternating. Guardian items will now count as legendary items. Uh, their sellback gold is now 70% of the original price, up from 40, which should make that a little bit more flexible. The Guardian Horn's damage reduction is up to 15. The Guardian's hammer attack damage is up to 25. The Guardian Orb's ability power is up to 40. The Guardian Orb will now also grant 15 health per 5 seconds to mana-less champions, while the Guardian Blade grants 150 health, 30 attack damage, and 15 ability haste. Invisibility Detection. We have had the Oracle's Elixir removed from the item shop. Cannon Minions and Super Minions, on the other hand, now each have one charge of a modified Umbral, Umbral Glaive Blackout passive, 900 range and 4 seconds of visibility once detected. So, if you have invisibility effects, you might want to avoid Cannon and Super Minions from now on. Let's see, Seraphine has been nerfed uh, in 10.23, going from normal to minus 5% damage dealt, plus 5% damage taken, and minus 5% healing. They really don't like her in ARAMs, do they? We'll skip over the end of season stuff because, well, that's just skins and stuff, but there are some ranked updates coming to the game. This preseason, we're making a couple of updates on the Summoner's Rift ranked system to make sure the placement, process, and climb is as informed and intuitive as possible. First, brand new accounts entering ranked for the first time will now take into account additional variables to ensure a more accurate original placement. Next, in order to smooth out progression speed bumps, we're removing promotion series for interdivision transitions. This means that going from Division 4 to Division 1 for any given rank will, automa will be automatic when you reach 100 LP, and any additional LP rolls into the next division. Consequently, demotion protection between divisions will also be removed so that losing a game at 0 LP will result in moving down a division. Last but not least, we're removing the ability to duo queue at ranks master and above to highlight competitive prowess and improve matchmaking at the top of the ladder. So, some League of Legends client updates. Another long list of League client bug fixes and quality of life changes this patch, so we're tucking them into its own section. Memory leaks should now be fixed in the following areas of the client, providing improved reliability. When a player views their profile, or, the pro or other profiles, when a player opens the Personalized Offers tab, when a player visits the TFT Party Lobby, when a player visits Match History, when a player visits the Clubs tab, when a player views a Hover Card, when a player visits the TFT Hub, when a player navigates among main tabs, when a player enters a chat room, opening a Champion Skin Chroma, every time the social panel is shown, client startup and after each game, when a player opens Runes Editor in Champ Select plus Collections, in Champ Select fixing a chat service observer leak, in Champ Select pre-made voice observer leak. The Rune page should now load faster, along with overall rendering improvements. End of game screen should no longer freeze when getting back into the client. Summoner Spell and Wart Skin selections have been re-implemented to reduce memory leaks. The associated animations in Champ Select have been removed as part of this work. Now, some bug fixes and quality of life changes. Kled now properly counts Skarl's health as bonus health. That's a good change. Vladimir's R, Hemoplague, incoming health indicator now properly appears even when non-champion targets are affected. Annie's E, Molten Shield, is no longer castable on allies outside of its intended range. Sona's E, Song of Celerity's tooltip now properly states her allies will get 10% bonus move speed. Casting Scion's E, Roar of the Slayer, right before being hit by certain crowd control effects, no longer allows the player to regain control of him over him for a split second. Kindred's passive, Mark of the Kindred's tooltip, no longer shows zeros in place of real values. Fixed Lilia's R, Lilting Lullaby's overhead indicator VFX on enemies. Samira's passive, Daredevil Impulse, no longer knocks up spell shielded or untargetable targetable enemies. Then we have some upcoming skins and chromas. Victoria's Lucian, Battlecast Nasus, Battlecast Sack, Resistance Jace, Resistance Singed, and Resistance Yorick, with Chromas for Victoria's Lucian, Battlecast Nasus, Battlecast Sack, Resistance Jace, Resistance Singed, and Resistance Yorick. <laughs> 
And that, my friends, is the end of the 10.23 preseason patch notes. We made it all the way to the end, and if you've been managing to follow me all the way down here so far, why don't you put the name of your favorite Monty Python movie in the comments down below, or say, well, what's Monty Python, you weird old man who lives on the internet? I've never heard of what that is. You're probably making that up just so you seem cool, like you know something that young people don't. You can put either of those things in the comments, and if you've been following along properly and picking up on my little clues, I'll know exactly who had the stamina to sit through all of this, for whatever reason you might have wanted to. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for watching, listening, sitting through this. Again, I'm not sure why you would. I did this mostly for fun, although, good lord, now I can feel it in my throat a little bit. You can like, comment, and subscribe. I don't do this kind of video very often, so if that's what you're after, sorry, not a frequent thing. And if that's not what you want, well, don't worry, this won't happen again for quite a while. <laughs> Um, I have a Patreon merchandise store and a tip jar. If you want to use them, you're more than welcome to, but if you don't, please don't worry about it. Um, if you do have online content creators whose work you enjoy, though, I would like to encourage you to support them directly with anything you can, whenever you can, because for an online content creator, a $1 donation can be quite literally the same as thousands of views on a video, so if you have someone who's niche, someone who does, like, content that's very specific or doesn't have a large channel, your support can actually make an absolutely huge amount of difference. Outside of that, uh, thank you very much for watching. Please remember to wash your hands and wear a mask. Subscribe to my second channel. I forgot about that. I also have that. Uh, wear, wear a mask, wash your hands, and try to act in solidarity with those who are working really hard right now to make the world a better place.